We are wrapping up a series called Back to School. It's a Holy Spirit series. We call it Back to School because hopefully you've been learning something as the weeks have progressed. Truth is, most people in this room have a relationship with Jesus, know God, love God, are going to heaven, but you might be missing out on one of the greatest joys on this planet, and that is the Holy Spirit. God has more in store for you. I guarantee it. In fact, that's one of the reasons I love our name, Colonial Hill. Colonial Hill is the district that, that our, it's the neighborhood that this church sits in. But I love the idea of a hill. If there's more, I want to keep climbing. If there's more of you, and that's actually where my personal journey with the Holy Spirit began. Is I just, I, I just was reading in the Bible, and I'm going, I wasn't taught a lot about the Holy Spirit growing up, but it's mentioned over 800 times in this book. And so I'm reading all of these things. They're all good. Everything I'm reading is good, but everybody almost is telling me avoid him. Didn't add up. So I started studying it, and I'm, I'm trying to teach it today to you to say, hey, he's good. He is absolutely good. There's a lot of misinformation about the Holy Spirit. There is um, some spookiness, um, even, frankly, weirdness associated with the Holy Spirit. And that's not because he is any of those things. It's because people... Have, have packaged him poorly. In fact, I almost titled this series Bad Rap because he's been given an undeserved negative reputation, especially if you grew up in a denomination like ours. So I've come to set the record straight, everybody. Week one, we talked about how the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost comes from the Greek word pneuma or the Hebrew word ruach, and it doesn't actually translate as spirit. It translates as blast of breath or wind. We looked at how many similarities wind and the Holy Spirit have. Both are unseen. Both are unpredictable. Both can be powerful and both can be incredibly refreshing. We talked about how the Holy Spirit is a him. He is a him. He's not an it. You cannot have a personal relationship with an it, but you can have a personal relationship with a person. By the way, he is the third person in the Godhead, in the Trinity, and the only active member in the Trinity working on any continent currently. So you want a relationship with the Holy Spirit. He wants to have a personal relationship with you, and not just a relationship. He wants to be your very best friend. You know what best friends do, everybody? They help you. And how does the Holy Spirit help you? Well, he gives you advice. He gives you direction. He gives you rest. He gives you freedom. We looked at all of those things last week. He gives you power. He gives you love. He gives you fruit. He gives you gifts. We're going to talk about that more today. He gives you all, it's just this wind in your sails. All of this stuff is good. I mean, good, 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 good. It's all good. He's so good. So why is there all this bad associated with him? I'll give you the reason. Are you ready? It starts with an L and rhymes with Pucifer. Okay, yeah, Lucifer, Satan does not want you having rest, refreshment, gifts, freedom, fruit, he, he, wind in your sea. He doesn't want you to have any of that stuff. And so the father of lies and the great deceiver has concocted some wild tales to trigger your timidity so you're avoiding the Holy Spirit instead of pursuing him, running away from and not toward, all right? And so that's, that's the whole heart of this series. I want to I get us all together and say, okay, what is God trying to say to us about the Holy Spirit so we can all get on the same page? All right, I need, let me see who I want to use. Come up here. Yeah. Come on, Hank. I got a gift for you, buddy. I got a gift for you, Hank. I was thinking about it, and I just want to bless you with this gift. When's your birthday? May 26th. Happy birthday. I'm a little late. All right. Go ahead and open it. Yeah. We only have an hour, Hank. Yeah, yeah, just rip it. Just rip it. All right. Open that up. See what you got, Bob. There you go. Will you wear that? All right, give it up for Hank. Come on. I love it. Wear it to the Tiger game. Wear, wear it around Tiger Stadium. Hey, let's give the Tigers a hand. Come on. They, they're blowing people out. I love it. I'm going to do, do a little humble brag. 
because Coach Sosa said I wasn't going to do it. But my son had an interception on Thursday night at the JV game. Come on, Zach Johnson. Let's go. All right. Sorry. Back to preaching. Okay. Listen, the title of today's sermon is Open Up. Open Up. We're going to talk about gifts that, the, that God wants to give to you. That gift wasn't Hank's until he opened it up and received it for himself. You feel me? So you've got to open up and receive what God wants to give you. He wants to give you gifts, but until you open, that gift was never Hank's until he opened it up and received it for himself. So you've got to open these gifts up and receive them. He wants to give you some gifts. And some of these gifts I know that you've received, perhaps. Some of them I, I don't know that you have. Receive them today. All right? I'm going to give you the order in which he wants to present his presence. Here's the first one. It's eternal life. God wants to give you eternal life. And the reason he wants to give you, and it's a gift, is eternal life, is because everybody in the building sins. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. That's Romans 3.23. Sin is just an archery term that means miss the mark. So if you're looking at a target, the bullseye is the target. Anything that's not a bullseye is called sin. When you shoot the arrow and it misses sin, sin, you miss the mark. And when we miss the mark, there's a penalty. There's a bill that is incurred for your sin and for my sin and all of us sin. And the bill that is due is, is death. The wages of sin is death. But God didn't give you what your sins deserve. He gave his son Jesus what your sins deserve and said, the gift, there it is, of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the gift, eternal life. That's your first blank. So he wants to gift you eternal life. So let me be abundantly clear. There is nothing else that you need to do that determines heaven and hell. Okay, Water baptism, we're going to do that next week. As Pastor Casey said a minute ago, we've had 30 plus baptisms already in the last six weeks. It's incredible. We've got already some more signed up next week. God is continually stirring the waters. You don't have to get water baptized to be saved. Now, I think you should do it. It's a necessary next step. If you place your faith in Jesus and you've never taken that next step, even Jesus took the step. He said, I'm going to do this to fulfill all righteousness. You should take the step too. But it does not determine heaven and hell. A relationship with the Holy Spirit does not determine heaven and hell. The only thing that determines heaven is that gift of eternal life, what Jesus did for you on the cross when he paid for your sins and he paid for my sins for all time. You put your faith in him, you put your hope in him, you put your trust in him, you give your life to him, and you get eternal life, everybody. That's the first gift. But there's a second gift, and the second gift is the Holy Spirit. It's what this whole series has been about. But it is a different gift. It's not given at the same time. And he did that on purpose because he said, I want to differentiate the two because I don't want you to confuse the Holy Spirit with the gift of eternal life. And I'm going to show it to you. So John chapter 19, Jesus dies for the sins of the world on the cross. He's buried. He rises again three days later. He appears to hundreds of people in a glorified body. He pops through walls. He appears to his disciples in a locked room. He breathes on them. And he says in John 20, he says, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins. So right there, that's when the disciples actually get saved. The disciples are hanging out with Jesus for three years, but they can't get saved until after he's come back from the grave. So that's when they get forgiven of their sins. And then in Acts 1, this is a little bit later, he says, do not leave Jerusalem. He's talking to the same disciples, but wait for the gift. So there's another gift that is to come. I thought they already got the gift of the Holy Spirit. He said, receive the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins. So that was for the forgiveness of their sins. This Holy Spirit gift is something completely different. And again, he differentiates the two because the first gift is all about heaven and hell and where you spend eternity. The second gift is how amazing life can be on earth. That's what that Holy Spirit gift is. It has nothing to do with your eternity. It has everything to do with right now. So he says, I'm going to give you the gift the Father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be. Notice it's future tense. This hasn't happened yet. You're going to be given something else, and the gift that's going to be given to you is you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. He goes on to say, or they, they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Which I'm sure he's going, what? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I just got through telling you guys, I'm going to give you this blast of breath. I'm going to give you this wind. I'm going to give you this amazing gift that's going to bless you and empower you and walk with you and be. John 16, 7, I just got through telling you guys a few days ago. 
40 days ago, I just got through telling you that it's for your good that I leave so that I can send the Holy Spirit to you. So the Holy Spirit inside of you is better than me beside you. This is for your good. He says, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you're going to get some power. There's going to be a power that comes on you when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you're going to be my witnesses right here in Snyder, where we're standing, in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, the surrounding areas, and to the ends of the earth. Guys, you're going to get some power. And then he ascends back into heaven. So this is the last thing Jesus said, which might mean it's a pretty important thing if it's the last thing that he possibly said. And here's the sad truth. Some of you have received the first gift, but you've never opened the second one. And it's available to you, but you gotta, you gotta receive it. There's a third gift, and it's the focus of today's message, and that's spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts. Um, let me show it to you in the Bible. This is Romans chapter 12, verse six, also in your notes. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. So the word gifts there is the word charis in the Greek, C-H-A-R-I-S, charis. And it literally translates as grace gifts. It's where we get the word charisma or where we get the word charismatic. But all it means, it literally translates as grace gift. You have this divine, unique, special ability to do things that almost come natural for you that don't come natural for other people. So I think I have a grace gift to communicate in public, to speak like some of you would soil your shorts if you had to speak up here every Sunday. You'd be like, no way, I ain't doing that. But there are things that you are gifted to do that would make me incredibly uncomfortable because you're, it's just natural for you to do that, and it is not natural for me. It's charis. It's a grace gift. I don't like the word charismatic. I don't use the word charismatic because people have given it a negative connotation. That's not what it means. Charismatic has never meant what people have made it to mean. I had, I had somebody ask me when I first got here, are you trying to make us a charismatic church? And I said, respectfully, we already are, because biblically, charismatic means that we've been given spiritual gifts by the Holy Spirit that we use to edify the body of Christ. And so we already are a charis church. Oh. <laughs> so I don't like that. It's just there's confusion. There's confusion with spiritual gifts. There was confusion, by the way, back in Bible times with spiritual gifts. Paul dealt with this. In fact, he, he plants a church in Corinth. They receive the Holy Spirit. They start getting spiritual gifts, but they start misusing and abusing the gifts. And so Paul spends three chapters, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, and he's just explaining spiritual gifts, misuse and abuse. This is how he begins the conversation. He says, about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. I don't want you to be uninformed, and that's my hope today. I want to teach you about spiritual gifts. I don't want you to be uninformed. They were getting a little out of control, and I think people today get a little out of control with spiritual gifts. Some people misuse them on this side of the pendulum, and then some people just refuse them altogether on this side of the pendulum. And I, like, Let's talk about it. Um, so here's a good question. Is our spiritual gifts for today? I believe emphatically, yes. Now, there is a group of people that have a doctrine called cessationism, um, they're called cessationists, and they, but the, word, the root word is the word cease. They believe that the spiritual gifts ceased when the apostles died. So the spiritual gifts were given to the apostles to start the church, and when the church got rolling along, then God took away the spiritual gifts. The problem with that doctrine is it's not biblical. In fact, I can make a stronger case that spiritual gifts still exist today, and that's what I believe, that's what our church believes, is that we still have charis operating in the building every single Sunday. We still have these grace gifts. There's about 24 to 27. Um, some of them are like, uh, you could make a case for 27. Some of them, is this a gift or is this just something else? But 24 to 27 spiritual gifts. I love this in verse 11. All these, all 27, are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. And then Paul, because he's trying to help us out, he gives this really good word picture. It's a clever and creative way to kind of help us understand this idea. It's kind of a, a, a massive concept. It's, it's really a parabolos. It's, it's this parable. He's like, I'm trying to get you to understand the idea of spiritual gifts. And he gives us this idea. And I think it was funny. I think when he read this to the church at Corinth, they probably laughed out loud. Uh, we kind of read the Bible. We don't see a lot of humor. I think it's funny if you just read it with a, a sense of humor. So I'm going to go to the end of it. 
I'm going to go to verse 27, and then we'll go back to verse 12 and work our way through the text. But I want to show you the end verse. So this is how he ends. He says, now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. So he's talking to the church. He goes, you're the body of Christ, and each one of you is part of the body. To which I'm sure somebody's going, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait. Christ had a body. He was on the earth. He gave that body for the sins of the world. He, the body was buried. The body came from the grave. Glorified body popped through walls. The body went to heaven. Christ had a body. He goes, no, no, no. That was then. This is a new thing. Now you are the body. Me? No, no, not you. You. Me? No, you, plural, are the body of Christ. Everybody in here is the body of Christ? Yes, and each one of you is a part of it. Even Aunt Ethel? Even Aunt Ethel. Well, she must be the appendix because she's useless. No, no. <laughs> You're all part of the same body, right? And, and, and he's trying to explain to us that we, he just got through talking about, Paul just got through talking about the relationship between the individual Christian and the collective of Christians called the church and the relationship between the two. And you don't have to hang out with any individual Christian very long before you start realizing they're nothing like Jesus. But collectively, we are. In fact, I love this thought, the closest you will ever get to being with Jesus on earth is being with a bunch of Jesus followers. That's it. The closest, unless Jesus comes back today, and he could, the closest you will ever get to being with Jesus on earth is being with a whole bunch of Jesus followers. Which is interesting because I came to faith as an individual, as did you. I started reading my Bible as an individual. I started going to church as an individual. I started uh, doing all these things individually, listening to music, praying as an individual. But the moment that I put my faith in Jesus Christ, whether I believed it or not, whether I wanted to or not, I joined the big church, the, big, the body of Christ. I became part of that body. And what's so beautiful about the body of Christ is we can do so much more together than we could ever do apart. Think about the, historically the things that, that the church has done in Jesus' name. We've built hospitals and churches and children's homes and orphanages. We've, done, we've sent millions on behalf of famine relief and AIDS relief and disaster relief. I mean, just the church is so much more powerful together. There's things I could never do on my own, but as the body of Christ, we do some amazing things. We is always better than me, everybody. And so, in fact, Jesus himself said, I love this in Matthew 18, 20, he says, where two or more gather in my name, there I am with him. In fact, the King James Version says, there I am in the midst of them. Wait a minute, wait a minute. So, so you're not here if I'm by myself? No, that's not what I said. I'm never going to leave you nor forsake you. I just lack a midst. Well, why do you lack a midst? I, I don't know. When two or more are together, it just reminds me of me. It just reminds me of the body. And so when there's a midst, when there's a, a group of people, I show up. So Jesus is here, everybody, because there's a midst. There's something that happens when you get the body of Christ together. Now, Paul goes on. Let me, let me go back to verse 12, kind of break it all down, and you'll see the humor. I think when he was writing it, you'll go, oh, okay, that, that is kind of funny. But he starts explaining verse 27. You're the body of Christ. Each one of you is a part of it. But then he goes back, and he's explaining this in verse 12. He says, just as a body. Now, he's talking about a physical body now, okay? So your physical body. The one has many parts, eyes, ears, nose, mouth, arms, legs. We have all these different parts. But all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. So I came to faith when I was nine years old. And when I put my faith in Jesus at nine years old, automatically I'm, I'm in the body. I'm now part of the body of Christ. Whether you came into the body before me or after me, we're part of the same body. Whether you came into the body in Snyder, Texas, or on the other side of the planet, we're part of the same body. We're all part of the same body. Whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, that means nothing to you. That was massive news to them. Wait a minute. Jews and Gentiles are part of the same body? Uh-huh. Yeah. Because there were a group of people that thought it was just for Jews. No, it's everybody. Gentiles is you and I. That's everybody. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, I think this is where it gets funny. Can you imagine if your foot talked, what it would say? Hey, I know I'm ugly and I stink, but you walk on me all day, so give me, a, give me some slack, right? <laughs> hey, when you're going to the bathroom late at night, turn on the light and stop stepping on Legos. It stings, man. I don't know what they would say. Uh, 
If your foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. Here's what he's saying. The foot and the hand, they're not part of the body because of the role they play. They're part of the body because they were placed in the body. Let me say that again. They're not part of the body because of the role they play. So the foot is not as important as the hand, some would say. I mean, my, my hands are pretty important. And I, why can't it be a hand? Hand gets, hand gets to shake everybody. Why don't you take my, stick me out every once in a while, right? Like, I, I, because I'm not a hand, then I'm not important. And some of you, you're, you're not the mouth part of the body. That's okay. That doesn't make you less valuable than anybody else. You're not part of the body because of the part you play. You're part of the body because you're part of the body. You're placed in the body. All right? This is huge if you'll catch this. If the whole body were an eye, <laughs> where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? Can you imagine, like, if, if your body parts could talk to each other, you know, your eyes saying, hey, hand, I don't need you. All right. Well, good luck putting your contacts in. Hey, you're going to get your glasses on your face. Okay, okay, I need you, right? Uh, now, this next part is, is so transformational. If we'll get this, it'll change how we involve ourselves in the church. But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. So the charis that you've been given by the Holy Spirit, the part that you have been asked to play, was exactly what God wanted you to play. So even though you look at another part of the body and go, man, I wish I was a hand, I wish I was a mouth, I'm just, I'm just a thigh. <laughs> Whatever the, you're an important part of that body, and that's exactly where God wanted you to be. And we function together to do what God's called us to do in Snyder, Texas. If they were all one part, where would, they, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Okay, let me just say this. You are indispensable. You're indispensable. You may not feel like you're indispensable, but you have a role to play. You have a part that's been given to you. You have charis that you may or may not be aware of. Fuller Theological Seminary says that 87% of the body of Christ don't know what part of the body they are. That's a travesty. I mean, I'm out here operating as a hand, but I'm not a hand. I'm really a foot. I'm, I'm something else. And so you need to find out what that part of the body is. And here's the beautiful thing, is when you're part of the body, your function is part of the body, we could, we could keep doing church without you. I could cut off my hand and lay it on this stage, and I could function with just one hand easily. But wouldn't it be so much better if I had two hands? Wouldn't it? It'd be so much better if I had all of the body parts working together. I would be more effective. The church is more effective. We're, we're okay without you. We're so much more effective with you. And let me also say this. For all of those who are watching at home, I'm so glad that you're watching. I honor you. Some of you, I love you, I'm not, I'm, this is not judgmental. Some of you left during COVID and you hadn't come back. You got comfortable in your pajamas, and I love you. But listen, it's the same analogy. If you cut off your hand and you're not part of the body, you're never going to really grow. So come back, all right? We love you with open arms. We got three services at 8, 30, 10, and 11, 30. We'd love to see you at the next one, okay? We want to grow together. We want you part of the body. That's why this is so important. But we got to be part of the body. We got to be part of the body. Got to be part of the body. And when you're part of the body and you know your role and you're, you're thriving in your role, man, it gets a ton of fun to do life. All right, so I cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. The head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, even the parts that seem weaker, they're indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, cut off my hand, every part suffers with it. So if you're not doing your role, the church is suffering. But if one part is honored, guess what? We all get to rejoice. When we had 30 plus baptisms over the last six weeks, we all celebrate that together. Hey, I was a greeter. God has given me the gift of greeting, and I, I was greeting that person. I'm, just, I'm a cheery person first thing in the morning, and I made them feel welcome when they came to church. 
Well, I have the gift of, 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 of taking care and, and loving and mercy, and so I was holding their baby. And I was holding their baby so they could worship worry-free, and they could have never met Jesus had they had a crying kid next to them. And so I was doing my part so they could come to faith. Well, I was back in the TV ministry, and they would have never even found our church had they not first stumbled across us online. And so I'm doing my part. To, we all get to celebrate when somebody gets baptized. Hey, we all played a part together. It's pretty cool. Here's the verse again. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. So play your part. So here, here's your three action steps, and then we're done really quickly. All right? The first one is you've got to discover your spiritual gifts. Discover your charis. Discover what the Holy Spirit is giving to you. He's given something to you. And I pray all the time. I'm like, Holy Spirit, give me more. Like, if you got other gifts, if there's 27, I want all 27. I don't have them. But I'm praying that he'd give them to me. If he's got more, I want to keep climbing Colonial Hill. I want to keep getting to the top of that. Give me more of your gifts. But I need to discover them. And the way that we do that here is through Growth Track. Growth Track happens on the first Sunday of every month. Guess what today is? First Sunday. Come on. Today at 1230 in the Fellowship Hall, we're going to do growth track. And we're going to cook more food than we normally do because we're expecting we're going to have some people that come to this service, didn't sign up, you're just going to show up. We want to help you find your charis, find your grace gift. So go, run an errand, come back at 1230, meet us in the Fellowship Hall, we'll feed you an hour and a half. We're going to figure out not only who we are, but who you are more specifically. Discover why you're on this planet. What is your part? I don't want you in the 87% who don't know. I want you to be in the 13% who know. This is why I'm on this planet. And then I'm going to challenge you to develop your spiritual gift, to develop it, right? Because some of you, you're going you're to find a gift. You're going to find a gift like exhortation, and you're going to go, what in the world is exhortation? What does that mean? We want you to develop that gift. So God's given it to you. You may not even know what it is or how to use it, but there's a couple of sub points to this one so first you can learn from scripture so today if you come to growth track you're going to get a spiritual gifts assessment it's not a test you cannot fail it It is an assessment we don't even see like oh i got a 40 i'm a bad christian no that's not how it works it's an assessment and you're going to figure out how you're wired and gifted and so it's going to say you have this gift and then it's going to give you some bible verses so if it's like exhortation it's going to give you bible verses you can look at and go oh okay that's how that's used. That's where that's in, in Scripture. And, it's gonna make, and you get to take that home. We don't even collect your assessments. We will never see them. It's for you to know, not for us to know. Okay? So learn from Scripture. We encourage you to learn from others. We can help you with that. We want you to get part of our dream team, which is what we call our volunteer here. And so Nancy, who runs our dream team, um, she's going to help put you on a team. And you're going to get around other people who have your same gift, who play your same part. And they're going to say, well, this is how I use the gift. And you're going to go, I've never thought about that. But that's really helpful. And so you're going to learn from other people that share your gift. And finally, you're going to learn from experience. I'm sorry, learn from others and learn from experience is the last one. Learn from experience. So learn from scripture, learn from others, learn from experience. So experience, you know, that's, that's the best teacher. You just get out there and you do it. And you go, oh, well, that didn't really work. Oh, that was really successful. That was really helpful. So we want you to, and we're going to give you an opportunity to use it, right? We, we want you to, to use it. That's the third step, by the way, is to use your spiritual gift. All right, if I'm a hand, I'm never used, then what good is my hand? Use it. If you've been given a gift, if you've been given a charis, a grace gift, a divine, special, unique ability by God Almighty, by the Holy Spirit, use it. It is so fulfilling when you do. In fact, I love this last verse out of 1 Peter. God has given each of you, there is a gift. He's given you this gift. From his great variety of spiritual gifts, use them well to serve one another. I want so desperately for you not only to open your heart to the Holy Spirit, but for you to see all the ways the Holy Spirit has already blessed you. And for you to receive those gifts and start operating out of those gifts, I'm telling you, your life, for the longest time, our church, um, the way we would do volunteers is, hey, we need child care workers who's willing to suffer for the, for the name of Christ. Right? Okay, I guess. And they go back there, and, and that's not their gift. And so they're filling a role, but it's not, they don't have li it's not life-giving. And so what we've changed it to is let's find out how you were wired and gifted specifically, 
and put you where you're supposed to be. I don't, I don't want a hand servant in the foot roll. I want a hand servant in the hand roll. I want a foot serving in the foot roll. Let's figure out what role you were meant to play. Put you in that role. You're going to love it, and the church is going to be better for it. Let's figure that out today. 1230, come meet me. Growth track. Let's go. Even if you're watching at home, come on. We'd love to have you. Be here at 1230. Now, I talked about three presents. And just like Hank showed us a moment ago, you got to open it and receive it for it to be yours. You cannot have the Holy Spirit and you cannot have spiritual gifts until you have that first gift. They come in order. You have to have that first gift, which is eternal life. Some of you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, what he did for you on the cross. So I want to give that invitation to you today. If you've never, ever given your life to Jesus Christ, today's the day. Let's go. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus, your Lord, and you believe in your heart, God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. So I'd love for you to bow your heads and to close your eyes, and even maybe you open your hands in a posture of reception, like I'm going to receive this, just right there in your lap, just say, God, I want to receive this gift. And pray this prayer with me under your breath. Just say something like, Lord Jesus, I believe you came to earth to die for me. I believe you were buried and rose again. And because you gave your life for me, you paid my price. You canceled my debt of sin. Because you did that, I'm giving my life to you today. Save me, forgive me, and lead me from this day forward. You're in control. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer or something like that, I'm telling you, it just happened for you. You got saved. We had two people that accepted Christ last week. We had two people the week before. God's constantly just doing an amazing work in these walls. And if you did that, I would love for you to text me the word saved to this number, 325-221-3001. All it is, um, it's going to send you a text back asking for your physical address. I'm not going to come see you. It's a hassle-free guarantee. I just want to send you something in the mail. Okay? It's, <laughs> you just got the gift from Jesus. I want to give you a gift too. Okay? It's just, it's a book that'll help you. And it's a super easy read. And it's, it's all these next steps of things you can do in this new journey with Jesus. Cool? So text me the word save to that number and we'll get that to you this week.